and great power rivalry, which impacts the global and regional political and economic dimension. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to invite our chair and our distinguished uh, speakers. The session will be chaired by Ambassador Rajiv Bhatia. He's a distinguished fellow at, Ga at Gateway House, and he was former Director General of Indian Council of World Affairs. Sir, may I request you to kindly give your opening remarks and uh, conduct the session, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, ICWA. Uh, for this uh, uh, very important uh, invitation to uh, a conference of uh, major consequence. Uh, thank you to all the organizers uh, who have organized uh, and hosted the inaugural session so well. Uh, I was uh, keenly listening to the interventions and I think I can say in all honesty that each intervention uh, carried uh, a special uh, message and a message of significance. So here we are now uh, starting of the first uh, technical session. And uh, this, as you know, is going to focus on uh, regional and global trends. So uh, essentially trends and developments that impact on India ASEAN equation and we are looking at the whole thing with a wider lens because if we do not do that, then we are unlikely to either dissect the relationship properly or uh, be able to draw suitable conclusions for the future. Uh, as chair, uh, taking just a few minutes, uh, I would like to frame this dialogue by pointing out that uh, there are at least half a dozen trends that need uh, uh, our attention. First of all, uh, naturally, the impact of uh, uh, COVID, uh, which has seriously influenced uh, the question of lives of human beings, human security, uh, and above all, economy. And it has also pointed out uh, the deep-seated inequity uh, in the world when it comes uh, to access to drugs, vaccinations, and other means to counter COVID. Uh, I recall uh, within a month after we discovered COVID back in March, April, 2020, think tanks were busy examining the world order post COVID. And I frankly turned down the several invitations to speculate on what the world would look like after COVID, because we knew that it was a very mature thing to do at that time. I think it is still too early to talk about the post-COVID world order. Absolutely. But we can still say, we can at least say that COVID is a major trend that impacts uh, our region in the Indo-Pacific. The second trend undoubtedly, strictly from the Indian perspective, uh, relates to the Galwan Valley clash, which uh, seriously impacted on India-China relationship. Since then, uh, many endeavors have been made, many of them successful in trying to bring the relationship back to some kind of a track of normalcy, but we are still not there. And therefore, the impact of this equation on our main theme uh, should also be assessed in my view. Third, a point which came up very clearly in the inaugural session, the intensification of US-China uh, collaboration, come competition, come rivalry, come, uh, you know, whatever you may wish to describe it, the relationship is of great importance. I think we are seeing in the last uh, one and a half years a strong pushback to China by the US-led uh, web of groupings. And so, in a way, it would be interesting to hear what our scholars say about the host of groupings which have come up in the last uh, one and a half years. Then there is, of course, the Ukraine war, which has um, transformed in many ways the international scene. We have, uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, a closer uh, U.S.-Europe combined, facing Russia, which has uh, allied uh, 
closely with China, although that relationship uh, remains susceptible to multiple interpretations. Uh, and finally, of course, there is uh, India, which remains anchored uh, in its uh, place of uh, strategic autonomy. So having, having listed some of these trends, I think we should also finally say that we should not ignore what is going on in the Middle East, particularly the launch of the latest uh, new quad relating to West Asia. And also, uh, if I may say, the trends and perceptions in Africa, where there is a very strong feeling that uh, Asian countries are combining among themselves in order to neglect and ignore Africa, even though some of us, including India, defines Africa as part of the Indo-Pacific. So, dear friends, uh, I'm sure there are many other forces, developments and trends which are shaming the regional and international scene today with a direct implication and impact on India-ASEAN equation. And we look forward to hearing uh, our uh, very uh, distinguished panel today. Uh, they have already been introduced through the mechanism of our very well-produced booklet. Uh, in any case, they are well known uh, to all of us. And I simply would say that each of them is requested to speak for 15 minutes uh, without reducing the chair to the role of a headmaster. Uh, and um, the order will be uh, now, um, we shall start and it's my honor now to request uh, Dr. Quick Chang Chui of the National University of Malaysia to take the floor and address us on this very important and interesting theme. Over to you, sir. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ambassador Rajiv, and a very good morning or good afternoon to uh, everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers, uh, ICWA and also RIS for uh, having me here. Uh, my friend, uh, Professor Pravira has uh, suggested me to uh, present a Southeast Asian perspective on global and regional trends. And uh, I thought uh, I should uh, emphasize at outset that Southeast Asia as a region, of course, is too diverse to have uh, any single one perspective. So what I'm going to uh, present, uh, it's only a one pers uh, a perspective, and uh, but I will try to uh, highlight uh, as much uh, common denominators and also uh, shared values and also uh, shared views uh, from the region. Of course, uh, in my Malaysian bate and uh, in a rather uh, strong Malaysian accent as well. So uh, for the next uh, 13, 14 minutes that I have, let me uh, just uh, highlight uh, three trends as uh, my three points. And uh, the first point and also the first trend uh, clearly is about Indo-Pacific. And I think by now, uh, and in fact, some would argue that uh, by 20 uh, uh, 20s, early uh, 2020s, uh, it's uh, become clear that the uh, Indo-Pacific has uh, already uh, evolved from a strategic construct to a geopolitical reality. It is a reality that we can see uh, more momentums are building up along uh, Indo-Pacific, but also uh, it's an uh, institutional expression, the Quad. And uh, we could uh, say that uh, the, the, uh, as, a, as a discourse, uh, Indo-Pacific uh, has already expanded beyond a quad. You are seeing that uh, not just uh, the quad members of the uh, United States, uh, India, Japan, and also Australia are uh, elaborating uh, and also expanding on Indo-Pacific. You also uh, see uh, European powers. Early on, uh, it was uh, individual powers, France, Germany, and the Netherlands, and then the uh, EU uh, as a group have come up with uh, their respective uh, Indo-Pacific document. And uh, this uh, does not uh, stop at uh, Europe. Uh, we are also, uh, as we talk, we understand that uh, this year, of course, uh, other countries, other powers uh, beyond Quad and beyond a uh, European uh, uh, front, uh, like for example, Canada, for example, uh, South Korea, and some would even uh, suggest New Zealand. They are also uh, in the process of uh, coming up with uh, some Indo-Pacific uh, related document. And uh, it's not just about Indo-Pacific, uh, Quad itself uh, is also expanding, it's also widening horizontally and also vertically. It's a horizontally in a sense that uh, we understand that uh, Quad 
started uh, as a security uh, mechanism, security uh, dialogue. But now uh, we have uh, seen very clearly that uh, it quite as an entity has expanded uh, from security mechanism to uh, also non-security mechanism that includes economic connectivity, so on and so forth. And it is uh, expanding uh, vertically in a sense that it's not just at the uh, working level, not just uh, at the ministerial level, it's also uh, been upgraded to the summit level. So uh, we could see that the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, as a construct and is becoming a reality and it is here to stay. Some power, some actors might not be comfortable, might not like it, but we all know that uh, by now, Indo-Pacific is a reality. With that, let me uh, move on to uh, my second point and the second uh, trend uh, that is uh, both regional, but also global trend. And uh, this second uh, trend is about three words. Geoeconomics are geopolitics in our century. I think uh, as an expansion of uh, security dynamics uh, spilled over to non-security uh, dynamics, you can uh, see very clearly that the uh, US-China rivalries are not just uh, competing on the military chessboard. It is also uh, competing on the non-military chessboard. So now what we are seeing is that uh, great power rivalry particularly US-China, but it's actually uh, beyond. We can also uh, see uh, lots of uh, second tier powers in Asia and out of Asia are competing along not just military transport, but also non-military uh, transport. Almost uh, every now and, here and then uh, we would uh, hear uh, some new initiative being uh, announced, if not uh, being uh, implemented. For example, uh, 2018 uh, onwards, uh, we have uh, heard that the uh, EU has launched the so-called uh, EU-Asia connectivity strategy around the same time when United States and uh, it was under uh, Trump, even Trump era, we have uh, heard uh, things like the Build Act. And then uh, we have also uh, read and, new and uh, talk about uh, uh, those initiatives uh, by Quad, uh, for example, the Blue Dot Network. More recently, G7 has uh, also uh, launched uh, the, so, uh, the uh, B3, B3 uh, the Blue, Build Back Better World, and the most recent one, of course, is uh, about the um, uh, PGII. And uh, we can see that these are all indicators of uh, US-China are competing not just on the security, the traditional security uh, transport, but also non-military transport that includes economic initiative. It uh, includes also a connectivity uh, building. It includes uh, pandemic cooperation that uh, uh, Ambassador Rajiv uh, mentioned at the outset. And uh, we could also uh, know that uh, with the launch of uh, Biden administration's uh, um, IPAF, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, second chessboard it's uh, at least at the surface as we can see as important as uh, the military uh, chessboard but certainly there are still uh, some unevil uh, attention uh, attached to uh, the economic rather than the security but uh, let me uh, leave uh, that issue uh, uh, for the moment and let me uh, cover the third and also uh, my final uh, point which is uh, the third trend that uh, we could see primarily in Southeast Asia, in ASEAN region uh, where I come from. But uh, I would say that uh, the similar or parallel dynamics can be observed also uh, beyond uh, Southeast Asia. So what is this uh, third trend is? And I think uh, the trend, the beginning of the words, certainly uh, will be very familiar to uh, my Indian uh, friends. And that, of course, is about non-alignment. And uh, in Southeast Asia, by now, we can uh, say that uh, ASEAN countries, if, uh, most if not all, are actually pledging and pursuing non-alignment via multi-alignment. In the sense that uh, this multi-alignment is one of uh, inclusive uh, basis, is on the impartial uh, basis, the two eyes, inclusive and impartial. So uh, it means that, that we are trying to diversify our strategic and development links, not just with uh, one side or one camp, but we are trying to uh, be inclusive. We need to diversify strategic and development links, not just uh, with US or uh, the so-called uh, Indo-Pacific partners. We also uh, make it a point that uh, with China, with other, including uh, Russia and so on and so forth, we would uh, need to uh, partner and uh, to some extent institutionalize it to have uh, some policy coordination that can be called as some form of alignment. 
Of course, alignment is different from alliance. There is no uh, mutual defense or commitment involved, but it is uh, certainly some form of uh, alignment in different degrees that allow two or more countries to partner in a coordinated uh, manner across uh, domains, some uh, more domains uh, than the others. And uh, that, would be, uh, that would lead me to my final point. So what drives this uh, non-alignment via multi-alignment trend in Southeast Asia and beyond? Clearly, it is about risk. As uh, things are getting more and more uncertain, as uh, US-China relations are getting more unpredictable, we do not know uh, what will happen uh, five, 10 years later. Uh, some would say that even now, we do not know uh, what will happen in 2024 and beyond. So uh, as uh, US commitment is also uh, becoming a question mark, we are not quite sure uh, how uh, China uh, under Xi Jinping will uh, bring uh, China to present itself uh, in the region and beyond. So things are uncertain. With uncertainty comes a uh, multiple form of risk. There are multiple risks, but I think uh, there are three types of risks that are most crucial. And I believe uh, they are not uh, uniquely to Southeast Asia, but uh, many other non-big powers, including uh, US partners and US allies, are also uh, seeing something similar. First, of course, uh, it's about entrapment. Smaller countries, weak countries, non-big powers are worried that as US-China rivalry escalate, we might be entrapped in one way or another. Many of us in maritime Southeast Asia, we are more nervous because of we think that uh, when US-China rivalry evolve, escalate into a big power conflict, we will be among the first to suffer. Other than the risk of entrapment, we could also, uh, there is a risk of uh, polarization. As uh, talks about Cold War 2.0 expands about decoupling, bifurcation, I think there is a genuine uh, deep-seated uh, fear about we are going to uh, see a return of regional, even a global bifurcation. So whenever we heard about the emphasis on the so-called uh, divide between democracy and autocracy, mm, we would uh, have a big question mark and we are getting more and more uncomfortable. Finally, that's about as a group, ASEAN as a group, we are also worried about the risk of marginalization. As more and more non-ASEAN initiatives gain momentum, Quad, AUKUS, some even talk about Quad Plus, certainly it's only natural for ASEAN countries to think. Will and to what extent, in what way, and how soon ASEAN as a regional grouping might be marginalized by this intense great power rivalry. And because of all these reasons, non-alignment via multi-alignment seems to a logical, if not inevitable, trend. With that, uh, I will stop here. Uh, back to you, uh, uh, Ambassador Rajiv. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for uh, uh, very precise uh, and finely tuned uh, intervention with which uh, you have uh, started uh, this conversation. I compliment you. Uh, I think uh, you have been so clear that it's hardly necessary for me to summarize your views, but I think uh, everybody would agree uh, with you that Indo-Pacific has now indeed become a geopolitical reality, as you put it. Uh, there is also very clearly uh, the trends uh, which are uh, being witnessed uh, in the region, uh, which make it very clear that the global, that the great power rivalry has uh, reached a new level of sophistication. And your third contention that uh, region, particularly ASEAN or Southeast Asia, is trying to secure uh, uh, non-alignment through multi-alignments. Uh, it may sound somewhat contradictory uh, in terms, uh, but uh, uh, life is complicated. Uh, and uh, when you see people moving left, actually they are moving right or the other way. And uh, as to the unpredictability and uncertainty, I think uh, this is a fertile ground that makes us, the scholars, very happy. Because uh, by saying that things are in transition, things are uncertain, uh, it's difficult to interpret them uh, without with any certainty. It means uh, I can simply see many, many more books and articles coming up <laughs> in due course from our region. Thank you very much. Uh, may I now? Uh, on this uh, very satisfying note, request uh, Dr. Rahul Mishra, um, an old friend uh, and colleague uh, of University Malaya, to now take over the floor. Over to you, Rahul. Uh, 
thank you, Ambassador Bhatia. Uh, it's indeed a privilege, uh, sir, to have uh, this session chaired by you, in which uh, Professor Shankari and my good friend Cheng Shui is also speaking. Uh, let me begin by thanking ICWA and RIS and also the ASEAN India Center, particularly Dr. Prabir Day and uh, uh, Dr. Nivedita Ray Ganjan and uh, Madam Mahavad for this uh, very timely and uh, a very interesting uh, conversation that we're having uh, that uh, put together a great uh, lineup of speakers covering uh, a range of topics relating to uh, ASEAN India in 30 years and how we are uh, positioned, ASEAN and India are positioned in this changing dynamics. Uh, Dr. Chen Shui uh, covered three very interesting uh, uh, ideas uh, that are shaping this region. I'll uh, take the rest of seven, uh, making it metaphorical uh, ASEAN 10. I'll start with the systemic and subsystemic factors that have direct implications on countries of the ASEAN region and also ASEAN India relationship. Some of these developments uh, indicate that India's engagement in Southeast Asia and wider, wider Indo-Pacific region are uh, shaped by India, uh, shaped by the U.S.-China dynamics, but also India-China, India-Russia dynamics. Uh, there is a growing uh, sense of anxiety in the, in the ASEAN region, and uh, uh, member countries of ASEAN and ASEAN as a regional body itself have been uh, re-evaluating, reassessing their relationship with all these major stakeholders. So recent developments on, uh, for instance, on the connectivity front or Indo-Pacific, how uh, ASEAN looks at Japan or India or, or the European Union, uh, the United Kingdom post-Brexit, is uh, indicative of this development that is happening, the reassessment that is happening. Now at the systemic level, the US-China rivalry, ASEAN position is very clear that uh, it doesn't want to uh, really choose sides. What it wants from India is to have a sort of moderating influence. ASEAN's approach to engage as many partners as possible is a really an age-old idea of having soft institutional balancing. So uh, if I may borrow Cheng Shui's eye, hedging is, defines the contemporary strategic notion of uh, uh, ASEAN, India, ASEAN's approach towards India. And in that sense, I think uh, I'd also, uh, from my point of view, make it clear that multi-alignment is something that is unique to India. Uh, partly because uh, India is the country that, that is really uh, getting more in that direction of alignment. It is no longer non-aligned. Of course, the flavor uh, is there, but non-alignment, uh, revised, upgraded, updated, is something that defines uh, multi-alignment. So India's, for instance, India's strategic defense alignment uh, with Russia on one hand and Quad on the other, um, not supporting AUKUS clearly, openly, but in a subtle way, keeping uh, lines of contact open with, with France indicate that it is India which is multi-aligned. ASEAN is still uh, non-aligned, beliefs in ASEAN centrality and ASEAN way. And, uh, it's okay with these mini lateral initiatives that are coming up, but still not taking any proactive uh, step there. So in that context of US-China competition, it is very clear that ASEAN is hedging and ASEAN is also open to new ideas. So for instance, uh, on one hand, ASEAN has signed and, and very much open to implementing the, the RCEP, but on the other, the IPEF. Seven of ASEAN countries have already said yes to the IPEF. Uh, IPEF, and those which are not part of it were actually not invited, right? So, uh, so this tells us very clearly that uh, uh, that ASEAN, as a collective of ten countries, is very clear. The sense, the mood is that we are not going to say no to the U.S. just because China is next door, big neighbor on on which uh, we rely so much, or the U.S. is such a uh, big power and strategically we are dependent on it. So we're not going to go ahead with RCEP. No, that's not happening. The second is Indo-Pacific. Inclusive, prosperous, peaceful. And that is why India's idea of Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative is very much welcome. Four of ASEAN countries, if you want to go wider in, in the Indo-Pacific region, Japan, Australia, and so many other countries have already endorsed this idea. So Chang Shui said there is a competition 
My idea is that this competition is a competition of proposals. ASEAN is very happy with that. ASEAN loves this idea of all these stakeholders coming up with new initiatives. Not fight with each other, but propose something new so that ASEAN can benefit. That's what Helsinki is about, right? So, and, and ASEAN's idea is to have, to accommodate all these new ideas and find a common, uh, for the lack of a better term, a common minimum program which includes India, which includes China, the US, European Union, Japan, and Korea, and what have you. So this actually tells us that this, these new developments on the Indo-Pacific front, for instance, uh, uh, Wang Yi's uh, recent visit to Southeast Asia, or China, ASEAN, the 30th anniversary, uh, in those two outcome documents or press releases, it was very clear that China is opening up to this idea of Indo-Pacific, but it is opening up to the idea of ASEAN's outlook on the West, which also uh, pushes aside all that criticism we've had of ASEAN, uh, AOIP, the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific as, an, as a compromise document. No, it was not. And we must applaud India for uh, including ASEAN's concerns in Indo-Pacific debate in uh, early on when we were talking about the ASEAN construct and uh, the vision, uh, at least from the part four, leading powers of Indo-Pacific, the vision documents. So I think to that uh, extent, ASEAN's outlook on Indo-Pacific and India's Indo-Pacific vision and initiatives such as IPOI are very much aligned with the uh, ground realities. China is also beginning to sense the importance of this, these initiatives. My third point is about the many laterals, uh, uh, starting with the elephant in the room, uh, which might surprise some of you. Uh, the elephant in the room is quad. Now, why am I saying that? It is because for those sitting in Southeast Asian capitals, whether you are in, um, in Hanoi or in Kuala Lumpur or in Jakarta, China is certainly the elephant in the room, but so is quad. A militaristic quad, a quad that is out there to convince ASEAN countries to join uh, the, the minilateral and make it a quad plus is is not uh, op- going to be openly embraced. We've seen that, uh, uh, you know, all other mini lateral initiatives, for example, AUKUS or JOKUS, the Japan plus AUKUS, or Korea joining the AUKUS initiative, or even this idea of Japan and Korea uh, aligning or participating in NATO summits is not appreciated. And the reason is, uh, that even though China is a problem, China is next door neighbor. China is a country on which majority of Southeast Asian countries are dependent. And unlike Quad, they cannot, they just cannot imagine dehyphenating themselves from China. India could do that. India could walk away from RCEP or the US could do this dehyphenation. Japan can uh, shift all its industries to Vietnam and other uh, countries. So can Korea, but Southeast Asia cannot. They are part of regional supply chain mechanism. We've got to understand this. And that's why uh, I'm really, uh, I mean, there are a number of scholars who've been supporting this idea of Quad Plus. I'm glad the South Block is not listening to uh, the proponents of Quad Plus. And uh, the only possibility there of Quad Plus is having a watered down, a toned down Quad Plus, which talks about higher education and climate change and, and connectivity, et cetera. But then that's the kind of quad nobody would, would, would like to join. If you are not interested in a, in a quad that is, you know, uh, that projects itself as a security provider, as a deterrent to China's aggressive postures, then there is no need for it. Uh, so we certainly want a, a gun that fires a bullet, you know, not a toy. So I think to that extent, quad first should consolidate and then work towards expansion, towards uh, any of these ideas of Quad Plus. Now, ASEAN countries also have this very peculiar habit of entertaining all the ideas that are thrown at them, right? So Quad Plus is being appreciated and all these discussions are happening because, I mean, primarily because they like to to talk about things. Security through dialogue defines ASEAN's uh, notion of security, right? So, uh, So Vietnam, for instance, is bound by these four uh, four modes, which is very clear. I mean, Vietnam is the most important candidate if you're looking at Quad Plus, but that's not going to happen because 
Vietnam cannot push aside its, uh, its notion of uh, four no's, or, or Indonesia for that matter. But then it also gives India an opportunity to work with these countries bilaterally, not go with Quad, but bilateral. Uh, let us look at the remaining um, uh, flip sides. The first and foremost ASEAN India context and the regional dynamics. Trade multilateralism is back in, in, in town, in uh, the ASEAN as it, if, if it were a town. We have seen how successful RCEP uh, is and it is going to be implemented soon. We've also seen the return of America with the Indo-Pacific Economic Initiative. Of course, it talks about rules and conditionalities. It's a set of norms, the four pillars, but uh, the next meeting is due uh, actually next week. And we see that these ideas are going to get uh, more formed up. As, a, as an emerging power, as a rising power, when we look at India's role in trade mini, uh, multilateralism, we see that, of course, India had its own concerns, but walking away from RCEP was uh, maybe not a very good idea. Uh, India had its individual concerns, but a great power, a rising great power, has got responsibilities. Those responsibilities, uh, I wish we were met. So maybe at one point, India must uh, consider uh, getting back into RCEP business, just because you've got problems uh, with a country on trade and, and uh, rules of origin issues, you cannot disappoint the other 14, right? So that should be the driving idea. IPEF is interesting because India is part of it at the margins, really, uh, along with Fiji. These are the only countries which are not part of any other mechanism, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation or any uh, any uh, other like CPTPP. So this is something on which uh, moving forward, uh, India should work on, uh, work on. And ASEAN countries, Indo-Pacific countries expect India to work on this uh, as a major stakeholder. Now, how is ASEAN looking at uh, assessing India and how does ASEAN see uh, India as a rising power, as a major stakeholder? I think the IC survey, Yusuf Isak Center of uh, Singapore survey, is a very, um, uh, very good guiding book on that. Of course, it's an, elite, it's an elite survey and doesn't tell you much about what the people think. But uh, fortunately, unfortunately, in Southeast Asia, it's an elite who determine foreign policies and also public uh, discourse. So I think on all counts, whether COVID diplomacy or connectivity or uh, India as a security provider, India is just uh, above Russia, South Korea, and New Zealand. Uh, and that's not a good sign. In absolute terms, India is certainly a formidable power, but when we look at the situation in, in relative terms, India is far behind uh, countries such as uh, Japan uh, or China, if you are looking at a competition, uh, or even Australia. Uh, now, absolute terms is cert certainly an interesting point, and I think on that part, India has done remarkably well over the past uh, roughly 30 years. Uh, 1989 was the time when Indonesia and Australia opposed India's idea of uh, procuring submarines. And 30 years down the line, Indonesia has offered India to build its uh, Sabang port. And Australia, of course, is a part of uh, many uh, mechanisms. So I think India's acceptability as a security provider has certainly uh, gone up. Through ACTI's policy, recent developments also tell us that defense uh, India as a defense exporter, defense collaboration has gone up. So we are, uh, we are looking at this trend that uh, Myanmar and beyond Myanmar and Vietnam, India is also trying to collaborate uh, uh, with Philippines and Indonesia, which, uh, which is certainly a positive um, outcome. Now, um, I just give one uh, last minute on my assessment. I think overall, past 30 years, India has made great strides if you look at India's performance in absolute terms. Uh, ASEAN has been equally receptive to ideas that India floated, partly because India's acted as a normative power. India has not played the game, uh, has not play, uh, played as uh, uh, any of the great powers second tier partner. And India should remain like that. Uh, we've seen this transition from Lokis to Actis. Now I think India has to uh, perhaps focus more on acting East, east responsibly. And that responsible 
behavior includes a more responsible approach on trade multilateralism, a more responsible approach on floating these ideas, ideas such as multi-alignment. Uh, India's very strong and, uh, and very impartial support uh, to ASEAN and also its stand on Russia-Ukraine crisis uh, delighted many in Southeast Asia. And that is something that India should do, uh, advocate what, it, what is in its own good interest rather than playing somebody else's game. So I think uh, uh, overall, this is how it should, uh, it should be seen and it should define ASEAN-India relationship. And I think in times to come, uh, acting East more responsibly should be the guiding way. And that is how ASEAN would be, um, would appreciate India's commitment and engagement. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rahul Mishra, for uh, uh, taking us uh, deep into the intricacies of uh, the strategic perspective uh, uh, connecting with ASEAN and India. You indeed are in a good position sitting in uh, Kuala Lumpur to interpret ASEAN for the Indian audiences and presumably India to the ASEAN audiences as well. Uh, I think we take on board your uh, essential point that uh, ASEAN is clearly hedging. Uh, it simply cannot afford to uh, take sides and therefore it ends up taking everybody's sides. Uh, this is how it works for uh, ASEAN. The intention is not to annoy or make anybody unhappy. So whoever comes up uh, with an offer uh, that ASEAN finds attractive, they go and buy it. Uh, we have noted also your, uh, uh, you know, observations about Quad and Quad Plus, etc. Uh, but we all know that uh, Quad has undergone a significant change from the time it uh, appeared earlier under the rubric of quadrilateral security dialogue. Uh, many scholars still think that uh, that is the full name. In fact, the official name is now only Quad. Uh, and uh, there is no doubt that the security and defense uh, element of the Quad have been uh, minimized, if not co completely eliminated, uh, which are being handled on a separate wicket. Thank you also for talking about acting East res responsibly. Uh, which essentially indicates that that is not the case today. So we would like to hear more hopefully in the discussion, uh, but there should be also perhaps some advice for ASEAN as well. And I hope that will come uh, from the other panelists in due course. So let me now invite uh, Dr. Shankri Sundar Raman, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University, a well-known figure on the circuit. Over to you. Uh, professor. Sir, thank you very much um, for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here on this panel and a good day to everyone because you're across multiple time zones. Um, at the outset, let me express my um, sincere thanks to the organizers, both the ICWA and the RIS, AIC, for asking me to participate in this international conference because as a person who's like looked at ASEAN for over 30 years, being there as part of the 30th anniversary of the India-ASEAN ties is indeed overwhelming. Um, the inaugural session that we heard this morning has presented some very important points and a broad understanding of the India-ASEAN ties. Uh, my presentation today, as the panel theme suggests, will be to look at both the regional as well as the global trends that are emerging as we consider the relevance of India-ASEAN ties. At the outset, let me state that there are three factors which outline the core of my presentation today. If we look at the Indo-Pacific region, this is where both the regional and the global are actually intersecting. And in the context, India-ASEAN ties provide the core of the region. The environment around this region is fast shifting and it is also having global implications. Now for both India and ASEAN, their regional environment has also taken the shape of the global environment. 
And this is where the immediate region is under stress, particularly because, as mentioned by uh, previous speakers, because of the geopolitical tensions among the great powers. So that's the first factor that I count in. The second, which will remain critical, has already been again highlighted in the um, inaugural session, is how the transition of a post-COVID world is emerging. And I think Ambassador Bhatia very clearly and relevantly highlighted this, that we're not in a post-COVID scenario yet. Now, if we see the kind of economic issues that have emerged, because we've seen that there has been some degree of, say, um, you know, um, slow emergence from the devastating fallout of the first two uh, waves of COVID that we saw. But if you look at the economic recovery itself, I think there is a lot of issues there which need to be at some point addressed. And the first is that if you see China's GDP growth for 2022, I think the World Bank has indicated that it might just be at 4.8. Um, I think we'll hear more of this from Professor Deepak Bali. If you look at ASEAN, there is an OECD uh, report that talks about the fact that the ASEAN region will have for the years uh, 2022 and 23, um, GDP growth will be at around 5.2. And this will be across a spectrum because countries like Myanmar will have a much lower growth, whereas countries like the Philippines may show around 7%. Similarly, if you look at the India projection, I think we're seeing that for 2022, we'll be looking at 7.2. Um, and uh, the GDP growth for 2023, I think Nomura has come up a few days ago last week. Nomura has indicated that in 2023, the growth will be impacted to about 4.7 to 5.4. So in that sense, if we still look at the economic indicators themselves, the signs of recovery are not very visible. Um, you're also continuously hearing the details of challenges emerging from different variants and subvariants, And as a result of it, I think the disruption that we've heard about in terms of what is impacting supply chains, disruption to labor, all these are going to become extremely critical factors in assessing both the regional and the global trends. The third is that great power rivalry is a given. And... It is important for India and ASEAN to evolve and find greater convergence both within the region and globally, especially given the continued uh, stress on the US-China rivalry, as well as the implications that the Ukraine crisis is, and, you know, is sort of adding to the entire dynamic. Now, why, to my mind, why is the regional trend important? Because if you look at the region itself as a region that is shifting because regionalism has always been based on functional realities. I've argued this before. And ASEAN's, we've seen this even in ASEAN's emergence in 67. We've seen the expansion of ASEAN to the Asia Pacific region as at the end of the Cold War. We've also seen how India has begun to embrace its foreign policy towards Southeast Asia at the end of the Cold War. If you take regionalism as, uh, you know, as a product of functional realities, then the emergence of the Indo-Pacific is also driven by a similar context. Because what we are seeing here is that the question of power change or the structural power changes that are happening in the region clearly pushes entirely the, the, you know, the dynamics of how the region is being shaped. And in that sense, it's not just because we've been talking about China's rise. So it's not just the rise of China, but how these implications that are arising from the rise of China are impacting the environment in which we are present, whether it is the regional or the global. And this is the context where I think the um, approach of India, understanding India's approach to the Indo-Pacific becomes relevant. And also where we can see certain synergies between, say, India and ASEAN in the larger context of how we evolve this regional and the global context. Um, if you take India's particular approach to the Indo-Pacific, I think it's driven by certain very clear points. And I'll probably enunciate a few of these here. One is the relevance that India places not just to the maritime domain, but also to the security of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Oceans. Now, increasingly, the presence of China in this region drives India into partnerships with other countries. Now, the, Rahul mentioned that multi-alignment is specific to um, India. I think multi-alignment, while is uniquely, um, you know, has come as a, you know, as a kind of a, 
um, approach to understanding India's foreign policy. Increasingly, when we talk about hedging, we also see that multiple countries are using multi-alignment as an option. So in that sense, I think for India, what I would say is that the combination of its approaches to the Indo-Pacific will be driven both by time-tested commitments to regionalism with its, you know, with its um, trusted partners in the region, which I think ASEAN is one of them. And at the same time, India will also be looking to embrace new dimensions, which will allow India both to leverage its strategic autonomy as well as its national interest. And I think there is no doubt on that itself, because while India was a bit hesitant to fully commit to the idea of an Indo-Pacific strategy earlier, I think increasingly the position that India has taken in terms of where it stands on its commitment both to you know expanding regional ties with you know like, for example with organizations like the ASEAN as well as moving towards other um, you know other frameworks that offer that offer India and a chance to find convergence I think India will apply both these approaches together now in terms of objectives that India has in the Indo-Pacific I think you've seen that as far as India is concerned, the objective is that it regards the Indian Ocean as a primary area of concern. Now, this was visible even as far back as 2015 when the India-US issued the joint vision for the Asia-Pacific and the Indian Ocean region. And increasingly, later we saw India and Japan sort of reiterate this joint vision statement towards looking at it as the Indo-Pacific. So this outcome has, has been mentioned earlier, has been driven by Japan and has become further relevant for the countries of the region in terms of how these dynamics have sort of evolved. Now, for India with ASEAN at its core engagement with the East, I think that will continue to remain very relevant. But in order to respond to the challenges as well as pursue the opportunities, India will explore commitments through bilateral engagement, through mini laterals, as somebody has mentioned, as well as through evolving multilateral frameworks that are already in the region. So in that sense, these will also remain extremely critical. And this would also perhaps engage, you know, explain India's uh, responsive um, sort of, you know, uh, approach to the Quad itself. And I'll come to this a little later in my uh, discussion. Now, where do I see the global? Because one of the points I made is where the regional and the global are actually intersecting with one another. Now, where do I see the global and the regional intersecting? Now, in my opening remarks, when I made this reference to the global and the regional, I want to recall a statement that was made earlier um, in one of the events by Ambassador Dinopati Jalal of Indonesia, who referred to the Indo-Pacific 1.0, and he actually goes back to the 2011 East Asia Summit, where both the United States and Russia were included. And he called this, he called this perhaps the first, you know, sort of Indo-Pacific 1.0. Now, if you look at whether uh, the EAS has been able to sort of move ahead on this, and I think that is where the ASEAN and the EAS have not been effective in that sense, because issues of preventive diplomacy have remained very much uh, outside the framework of all these mechanisms. Now, what we see is that while there is a consultative approach, the question of how we approach preventive diplomacy is actually one of the areas that needs to be addressed. And this is where I see that India's approach to either the ASEAN or to the Quad are not diametrically opposed, because if you look at the joint statement of the Quad summit that came out last year, as well as if you look at some of the areas that are common on which ASEAN and Quad are likely to find a uh, common ground, I think there is a great space for convergence between the Indian Oceans, uh, Indian Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, and some of the areas that the Quad itself refers to. Now, what is interesting in my mind is the, um, the question of ASEAN centrality has multiple times emerged, and I... While many people have said that there is an effort to pay lip service or a rhetorical lip service to the context of ASEAN centrality, I think that this is not this is not something to be taken lightly, because ASEAN has, like I think Ambassador, uh, sorry, I think Professor Raja Mohan said it that ASEAN lies at the heart of the Indo-Pacific. ASEAN centrality is at the heart of the 
what this mega region is being called as the Indo-Pacific. And this is very important because it is important to understand that the challenge of managing the shifts require um, convergence of multiple stakeholders, including ASEAN, which is one of the main stakeholders for the region, as well as to explore opportunities for convergence through various other layers and approaches that are evolving. Now, where, do, where does the global therefore meet the regional? And I think this is where the global trend and the regional trend actually interact or intersect. Now, if you look at the joint statement of the Quad earlier this year, I think in February, it indicates there are certain increasingly relevant areas where the, you know, the Quad will actually take uh, uh, an, an interest. And while we're looking at Quad, I think Arahul mentioned this in terms of the Quad's militaristic approach. There are different aspects which I also want to come in on because on the broad consensus in terms of the Quad evolving as um, an option for uh, maintaining or sustaining a normative order. The, I think the post the pandemic or the pandemic world that we're living in has also unleashed several other issues that we're seeing, whether it is climate change, whether it's the question of redressal on the pandemic, whether it's the question of economic revival from the pandemic. We have to understand that what has an equally uh, important investment in terms of looking at these areas, which we completely tend to sort of push into the realm of non-traditional security. But these issues have impacted us as, in, as intensely as the traditional security challenges in the region. And I think this is where I see an intersection because the Quad offers what I would see as one layer among the multiple frameworks that exist in the region. And I think this has been stated by uh, Dr. Cheng Chui also when he referred to the Quad expanding both vertically and horizontally. And as a mega region, I think the importance is for us to raise the question whether the ASEAN and frameworks like the Quad can actually find areas of convergence. And um, this is where on the security aspect, maybe it would be important to recognize that when it comes to uh, managing the challenges of great power rivalry, both um, you know organizations like the ASEAN as well as Quad need to actually find areas where they converge rather than looking purely at it as diametrically opposed um, areas. Now, coming to the global trends itself, I think when you look at the, I want to raise a few issues in terms of how the systemic but, level uh, challenges. Dr. Shankari, could you yes, please sir. conclude in one minute or so? Yes, sir. I will quickly conclude. Thank at you. the global trends, I want to just raise a few points. That when you look at the way the systemic level is emerging, first you see the Russia-China summit and how it has evolved. The kind of shifts that are occurring between the three systemic players, Russia, China, and the United States, is going to become extremely relevant. In terms of um, uh, why the normative issue becomes important, I think this is where the question of the India-ASEAN um, relevance and India-ASEAN's contribution to the region becomes equally important. So let me just conclude, because I guess I've exceeded my 15 minutes, that you know when you look at the question of complementarities, I think these complementarities have to look at finding areas of convergence which can address both the regional and the global challenges. And if I have to go back to last month's um, you know, joint statement that emerged on the occasion of the India-ASEAN summit, there is no reference, even one reference to where the dynamics at the systemic level are impacting the region. Whereas we've heard from everybody, the two speakers ahead of me, that there is a, there is a concern over this, but this concern is not even highlighted in the joint statement. I think some of the aspects is for us to recognize that increasingly the regional and the global trends are intersecting and that we have to sort of India ASEAN has to evolve certain mechanisms to at least put that into our consultation process at the first level. So let me stop with this because I'll take the rest of the question issues on the question and answer session. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shankri. I think uh, your, your central point is uh, very valid. Uh, uh, there is a very clear uh, uh, area uh, where issues of uh, global and regional politics intersect very deeply and extensively uh, 
in in simple uh, language we are trying to say that uh, while our focus is on indo pacific the rest of the world is impacting the indo pacific and indo pacific in turn is uh, impacting the rest of the world so it would be a pity if india asean uh, relationship scholars uh, were to wear a blinker and only look at what is happening inside the region so there is a very good question has been an interesting and of course uh, you have expressed scholars you are regularly deliberating on issues. possible agents you would have to ask to discuss them as uh, we go along This Attention is also drawn towards the various spheres of contact of which script and language form a significant area. When I would like to invite the uh, manifestation uh, of Dr. culture, uh, Professor B. R. Deepak, Jawaharlal Nehru University, to take the floor. After the station, highlight Sanskrit culture. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Bhatia. There is there some uh, background uh, noise coming in? Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, uh bhatia at the outset i would also like to thank uh, the host icw and uh, rs especially professor day for uh, uh inviting me and to be part of this proceeding i'm uh, really delighted uh well i would be talking uh, about uh, the elephant in the room uh, and uh, uh, how does it perceive uh, india's uh, engagement uh in the southeast asia and they call it uh, india's eastward march uh perhaps uh, you know uh, uh drawing parallel with what wang qi is one of the you know top most strategist in china has uh, termed china's westward march my formulation and arguments uh, they are primarily based on uh, you know chinese sources uh, uh, articles research articles written by a uh, people from uh, uh, like uh, kekir completely uh, without uh, it's going to promote me i know and uh, you know people from uh, cis uh, both these are very important uh, think tanks in china so one is affiliated to public security and another is ministry of foreign affairs uh, in china and others there are also uh, academics from peking university uh, school of international studies uh, and uh, some of the regional think tanks like uh, shanghai institute of international studies and various other universities uh, you know those who look into uh, indo pacific or asia pacific are the chinese you know they shy away from using the term indo pacific uh, uh, even today though it has been uh, used you know by the academics quite often but always in the brackets or in quotes so there are three uh, uh, parts of my uh, speech one is how they categorize the three phases uh, of india's eastward uh, march strategy they call it and the second is strategic goals and limitations of uh, india's engagement and the third would be a chinese responses or i call it uh, china's india dilemma in uh, southeast asia and some concluding remarks i hope i am able to finish within the uh, the, the time allotted time as far as uh, three phases uh, of uh, india's locus policy or actis policy uh, are concerned so chinese scholars so they, uh, uh, they 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 classify them into three stages the first is strategic uh, layout uh, from 1991 to 2002 and the second strategic expansion from 2002 to 2030 and finally the strategic partnership uh, primarily with the uh, quad uh, countries uh, from 2013 to date and reasons for india's eastward engagement uh during the first uh, phase they are cited as india's economic crisis pressure of globalization and china's gradual economic integration with southeast asia even though if we uh, if we uh, tally the figures india's uh, uh, you know trade volume with asean during this uh, period in time it was just 8.3 billion us dollars 
uh, of course, it was still four times that of India's uh, uh, trade volume with ASEAN. Uh, I won't uh, enumerate the kind of successes the Chinese uh, have uh, uh, enumerated. These have been already you know, talked about in the uh, opening uh, inaugural session in the morning by, uh, by, by some of the uh, speakers. But what is important is the third phase, uh, which China finds problematic and has reacted very, very sharply. The formation of uh, a strategic uh, arc, uh, they call it, uh, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, with uh, Japan, US, and Australia as three poles, uh, and they specify the period since 2014. Uh, and also the mechanisms such as uh, Sagar, uh, Bimstack, and Iora, uh, have been pronounced as serving objectives of Indo-Pacific strategy of the U.S. Uh, uh, for example, according to uh, Professor Wang uh, Lina of uh, School of International Studies at Peking University, uh, uh, he says that India has been setting the agenda of these groupings aimed at shaping its leadership and expanding its influence in the Indian Ocean region thus attempting to create a unified Indian Ocean identity and Indian Ocean regional community. Now, I'll move to my second uh, 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 point, that is strategic goals and uh, limitations. China has all along believed that uh, India's engagement in the uh, Asia Pacific, it is owing to a number of factors. The foremost uh, goal, according to them, is India wanting to be a great power or seeking great power status, as they uh, call it, you know, right from uh, uh, Prime Minister Nehru to Prime Minister Modi. Therefore, India's March East was strategy that aims at forging close economic and defense partnership with ASEAN, U.S. and its, and its allies has been, you know, uh, 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 deliberated in this context by Chinese scholars. Unique geoeconomic conditions, uh, according to the Chinese scholarship, will inject vitality into the rapid development of Indian economy. India's close economic ties with the East and South Asia will be conducive to build the economic uh, uh, corridor, which of course had been materialized recently in the form of Indo-Pacific Economic uh, Forum, uh, which of course has invited a lot of criticism from the Chinese scholarship, but also from uh, you know, the leadership. <laughs> India, re India uh, realigning its uh, activist policy and sub-regional and multilateral mechanisms like BIMSTEC, Sagar, IORA, and Quad are said to be serving the unstated goals of India, India's Indo-Pacific strategy, though Shankri has try, tried to elaborate some of the goals and objectives, but according to the Chinese, these are still unstated by India. Uh, I think it would be better if India is ambiguous about these, not pronouncing them very clearly, as perhaps it is the case with the United States. Uh, uh, as far as Taiwan question is concerned, but of course it is still debatable. Uh, therefore, uh, you know, in this context, you know, one of the scholars from CIS, so he says that uh, that, that uh, it is uh, uh, dwarfing of the activist policy by make, uh, make by by India, that is, you know, belittling the the activist policy. Uh, and, and making it subservient to the Indo-Pacific strategy, which, according to the Chinese, will make it difficult for India to achieve substantial progress in its relation with ASEAN. India's engagement with uh, ASEAN has also been uh, seen through the prism of a multipolar regional order, so Tochi Huati Shui Trishu, aimed at reshaping the international order by India. It is India's advocacy for this multilateral uh, uh, engagement that I think uh, China has been, uh, you know, uh, engaging India in uh, multilateral uh, uh, 
mechanism like BRICS, uh, SEO, AIB, and sometimes, of course, it is also questioning why India is in these uh, uh, mechanisms. So if it is uh, having its own small cliques, they call it, uh, you know, Xiao Chuan's Tobian Tui, small clique uh, multilateralism. Uh, unlike the real multilateralism or true multilateralism, uh, which is advocated by China through these uh, uh, institutions like BRICS and others. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, so these cliques, so they are uh, in the form of uh, uh, Quad, AUKUS, uh, 5i, even 7G has been included in these uh, small cliques of late by China. Perhaps I to YouTube would be soon, you know, included uh, uh, into the list. Nevertheless, China holds the view that India still uh, is relatively weak in terms of economic and political power and argues that India's broader geopolitical ambitions have to an extent been held in check by its rivalry with Pakistan and China. This is clearly stated by them, and they, they, they believe that China should be, you know, continuing with this. Uh, China is quick to refer to the massive China-ASEAN trade, uh, which is uh, 878.2 billion U.S. dollars uh, in, was in uh, 2021 against India's 78 uh, billion. This last year, of course, now we have uh, seen that it has reached uh, 100 billion U.S. dollar. But still, if we compare it with uh, ASEAN's uh, trade with China, or China's trade with ASEAN, it is eight times you know, larger. So there, uh, they, uh, they, they, they make this point. So they argue that it is owing to India's limited financial com capacity and complex multinational construction procedures that projects such as India, Myanmar, Thailand, Trilateral Highway, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal project, Project Mawson, which we don't talk about now, Sagar, Bimstack, Kaladan multimodal transit transport project uh, are progressing rather slowly. According to them, India and ASEAN seriously lack endogenous motivation for economic and trade cooperation, notwithstanding the FTA both have signed in 2009. Internal and external drivers in terms of opening up business environment, labor force have been compared, rising tariffs, self-reliance, and Sudeshi Astra have been regarded that anti-free trade, and also cited the reason of not signing ASEAN led RCEP, perhaps they don't call China led uh, RCEP, they got ASEAN led RCEP, and Sami the case with CPTPP, which is led by Japan. <clears throat> now, my third point uh, is uh, uh, China's India dilemma and its responses. So China is cognizant about an emerging India becoming a strong competitor of China in the Indo-Pacific and apprehensive that India can be a drag in developing Sino-ASEAN relations in future. Therefore, it has been questioning as to what interest India has to defend in the region. From this perspective, though the Chinese scholars accept presence of Indic culture in Southeast Asia, however, quick to posit that region has been within the orbit of Sinosphere. It is for this reason that China perceives India as an Indian Ocean power rather than an Asia Pacific power and hence an external power by Pushri in East Asia. China and Malaysia preferring to use uh, 10 plus 3, ASEAN plus China, Japan and ROK is a vehicle to shape the region into a desired economic community and exclude the US and India in the region, you know, has the similar undertones uh, uh, by, uh, according to the scholars from uh, Kikit and Tsinghua University. That is the general belief that China and the activist policy has widened in scope. Uh, India's activist policy provides an opportunity for India to intervene in Asia-Pacific affairs, act as a balancer, engage in strategic balancing of China by way of India, China, India, Japan, US, Australia, strategic arc and weaken China's influence in Asia-Pacific. 
Therefore, China has denounced the Indo-Pacific as a containment theory aimed at diminishing China's geopolitical and economic influence. Even though China has all along harped that India is very low in China's foreign policy calculus, however, India's policy of multi-alignment, which was spoken by, earl, uh, by earlier speakers, especially in the Indo-Pacific, has belied that thinking. Chinese scholars have recognized the fact that the U.S. no longer treats India from a U.S. U.S.'s regional policy framework, fram framework of South Asia, but from a global perspective. And I think that is true because India also believes that India's global aspirations would be realized if we, uh, if we align our interest with the United States and allies in the form of building these hubs and spoke, spokes from uh, hubs and spokes to alliances, uh, uh, a network of alliances, uh, as some of the Japanese scholars so they have uh, pronounced uh, you know, of late. It is perhaps owing to, uh, owing, owing, owing to this, uh, you know, uh, that Chinese scholars talk, talk about cognitive asymmetry between India and China. Uh, uh, Sir uh, Putui Chang uh, generally held responsible for not pushing uh, India-China relations in a positive direction. Perhaps this uh, is sometimes also pronounced, myself have pronounced it, uh, China looking down at India and India not thinking big about China. Of course, it can be you know, further expounded into different areas. China holds the view that since India's activist policy is in cahoots with U.S.'s rebalancing to Asia or the Indo-Pacific strategy, which has resulted in a situation where the U.S. and India are unitedly balancing China, this along with uh, small clique, uh, cliques are attempting to reconstruct the network of alliances and partners of the United States in the Asia-Pacific region. However, they also believe that owing to the U.S. policy of saying one thing and doing another, it is unlikely that ASEAN is pulled over to the U.S. As regards India, you know, some of the scholars from uh, CIS again, they believe that India in this recent years has been deviating from the principle of ASEAN centrality and accelerating its shift to the Indo-Pacific strategy of the United States. However, they persist that ASEAN countries are looking for real money, uh, not empty promises. Uh, you know, one of the scholars, uh, Sun Xiu Hui, so he says uh, that U.S. committing just $150 million during the recent U.S.-ASEAN uh, special summit in U.S., you know, is almost negligible. And uh, Fudan uh, University professor, uh, Tang Weiwei, so even he scoffs, you know, laughs at it, that this is uh, negligible. Uh, I think and since- Dr. Deepak, uh, could you please uh, uh, conclude in about a minute or so? Yes, uh, yes, yes, Ambassador. So I'm uh, just Thank concluding. You. So maybe I'm making my, uh, you know, uh, concluding remarks. So yes. it could be seen uh, from the writing of the Chinese scholarship that their understanding of India's active policy or its engagement uh, uh, with the Southeast Asian countries uh, has undergone fundamental change. From Indian perspective, this could be attributed to power shift with the rise of China and widening asymmetries with India, its belligerence along the line of actual control and Indo-Pacific, as a result, the kind of equilibrium and understanding that existed between India and China has been lost. And the ambiguity and the nature of India being a swing state between the U.S. and China has been addressed. This is perhaps what Prime Minister Modi has clearly stated that India wishes to be a leading power, not a balancing power. It is in this context. Nevertheless, China still holds the view that irrespective of grand strategic goals in the Indo-Pacific region, India's strategic vision is governed by thinking on South Asia and the Indian Ocean for the want of economic heft as well as its adversarial relations with both China and Pakistan. This, however, is not to say that India is not seeking to play a strategic role in the Indo-Pacific region. It certainly is, but India has not yet publicly stated its strategic goals in the Asia-Pacific region. 
though they acknowledge the fact that Southeast Asian countries are positively inclined towards India's engagement in Asia-Pacific region, but most of them have not expressed their support for India's role as a net security provider in the Western Pacific. They also admit the fact that at present, the informal alliance or the strategic consensus between U.S., India, and its allies is purely due to China factor, and that if India desired China to recognize its role in Asia-Pacific region, then India must see a certain role in the Indian Ocean region for China. Will India become an Indo-Pacific power? Many argue, well, they say that it depends upon India's economic, technological, military drivers, along with soft power, diplomatic, and leadership skills. With this, I thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Deepak, uh, for a fascinating uh, uh, glimpse into the uh, uh, thinking of Chinese scholars. Uh, I think uh, what you have presented is something that we um, Southeast Asia scholars or scholars of Southeast Asia India relations must hear all the time. Uh, both uh, ASEAN uh, side and the Indian side, it does give uh, a depth which often is missing in our dialogue. So very insightful uh, presentation you have just made. Uh, I would like to come to you, but let me first check with the uh, organizers if uh, we have received uh, uh, any questions from the audience because our panel First round of discussions have been completed. And if there are any questions, then we can, or will audience like to ask? Uh, so there's some any questions. Yeah. So there are some comments on the chat. If you can, uh, if it's visible to you. So. No, no comments in the chat. Comment? Uh, I can't see them here, but uh, if, if it is possible, can you read it? Uh, uh, and then uh, no uh, comments. Can can hear and Sorry. I can give uh, a chance. Here. Okay. So there's no comments on the chat. So if there's any comments okay. from here. Yeah. Okay. No, I think we still have about, I think, uh, 10 minutes or so. Or you would like to uh, even slice that a little bit more. Tell me how much time do I have and then I know how to run it. So five minutes, sir. Okay, fine. Five minutes. I think uh, what I would like to do is to put... Uh, uh, a few general questions, and then uh, I would invite uh, the panelists in the reverse order to take a minute each to say something that may still be on their mind. Uh, essentially, to Dr. Deepak, uh, you know, once again, I express my gratitude, and uh, I would like to ask for his personal assessment of what Chinese scholars are saying on India's uh, engagement with the Indo-Pacific. Uh, to what extent, uh, uh, in his view, they are reflecting their own independent objective judgments, and to what extent they actually uh, serve as the mouthpieces of the government of China? I think this is my first question to him. Uh, Dr. Shankri, uh, I do apologize for interrupting you, but uh, this was done uh, strictly in professional terms. Uh, it's always a pleasure to hear you. Um, my question to you is um, basically whether um, uh, you feel uh, that uh, the Indian government's uh, tendency to be quite content and satisfied with whatever has been achieved by ACTI's policy is justified or whether uh, you know they really need to strive harder uh, this is my question to you. Uh, Dr. Raul Mishra, you have been uh, quite uh, um, critical uh, of the uh, Indian approach in many ways for good reasons. Uh, my question to you is, uh, how do you look at ASEAN, this tendency on part of ASEAN to think that uh, in this partnership only India has to deliver and not ASEAN? Is this justified? Uh, and finally, uh, to uh, you, sir, I can uh, uh, ask a more gentle question. I can be a little bit more aggressive with Rahul, but not with you. Uh, 
with you my essential request is to spell out once again if there are any serious uh, internal differences in asean on the approach towards india so dear friends uh, floor is yours dr deepak can you please go first thank you ambassador for asking this question uh, i i think uh, uh, i don't find any independent uh, uh, you know uh, reflections from the chinese uh, scholarship uh, mostly uh, they tow the government line for example uh, uh, their foreign minister wang yi so he uh, uh, spells out four propositions on practicing true multilateralism you know as soon as uh, uh, his true multilateralism uh, Uh, sort of paradigm was out so many chinese scholarships so they scholars so they have taken it up and tried to elaborate on the lines of what he has uh, spelled it out but i think there is no room for uh, uh, i would say uh, uh, independent view in china especially nowadays uh, perhaps when the equilibrium was there it was slightly i would say that but after it has been lost uh, it is mostly you know, what the government and the leaders they say Thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. Uh, Professor Shankari. Um, thank you, sir. Um, let me just sort of uh, reflect a bit on what you, the question that you asked in terms of whether India needs to do more. I think the, um, I think when we started the Look East policy itself, it began, um, you know, with implications for the economic relations and the integration with ASEAN. and interestingly when we look at it we have really not moved even up to the mark of say 100 billion us dollars in terms of the trade with asia and i think this was very well brought out by professor deepak's uh, presentation where he showed the volume of trade between china and the volume of trade between india with the asia region so on the economic drivers i think there is a lot that is left um, undone so far from the indian side and that i think will be particularly related to areas of connectivity every year we hear the delay in the connectivity projects we hear in terms of the uh, deficit towards addressing where you know the connectivity projects are moving and if we read the volume the literature that is there we keep seeing the literature going back and reemphasizing the same thing often and over again and i'm being very um, critical as a scholar here because i have that freedom in that sense to say that where are we moving ahead you know and i think that's a very important question to ask um on the asean side i think if you look for example asean's entire framework is also to keep the region economically very very viable and this is why they keep moving into economic arrangements like the rcep the degree of economic uh, integration with china also makes them um vulnerable in terms of their strategic autonomy vis-a-vis -vis china and yet they are pushing the economic card constantly and this to my mind is not the only card to be focused on where the asean has to also clearly look at the security implications that are emerging and this is where i think the intersection like i said the intersection of the region and the global actually comes into uh, place as far as the asean region is concerned i'll stop with this thank you thank you very much thank you very much Dr. Mishra, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, well, I'll start by saying that please don't uh, attribute or connect my comments with the color of my passport. Uh, my responsibility here today was to represent the Southeast Asian side, uh, and that's what I try to do. Uh, Dr. Shangchui would vouch for me that when I speak on India-ASEAN relations and present the Indian perspective, I'm uh, really not the most uh, admired man in the conference uh now if we look at the situation on the ground and if we are allowed to call a spade a spade we don't have a uh, hippocratic oath in international relations scholarship but the narrative really is that uh, india's uh, india has not done enough i mean india asean relationship in absolute terms as a neighbor as a country that has had look east policy and act east policy in thousands of years of engagement it's fine now it has to graduate to the level of a responsible superpower or a responsible rising superpower these are responsibilities that we have to be very clear you want to take it take it if you don't want to take it be happy with the relationship and doing act east and 
increasing your trade volume from 1 billion to 20 billion, that's fair enough. Nobody's objecting to that. But if you want to play the game of a superpower, a security provider, you better play that game, right? You be sincere about it. So I'm not saying, and let me be very categorical here, I'm not saying that Acti's policy is not delivered, Lucas has not delivered. All I'm saying is that in absolute terms, it has uh, all these initiatives. But as a great power, as a rising great power, India has got to do more. India has got to behave more responsibly. Now, uh, if I can take the liberty in half a minute of Quad. Uh, countries of ASEAN region have accepted Quad purely because India is in it. And Japan has also uh, been playing a, a responsible role there. And no other minilateral initiative has been accepted ever in Southeast Asian history. Why Quad has been accepted? Because India is there, and especially Quad 2.0, post 2017, post Galwan. There is a reason for that. Let us not add non traditional security, etc. And uh, I hope we are bound by Chatham House uh, rules here. I uh, had the privilege to talk to uh, uh, people from the Ministry of two neighboring countries. Uh, uh, and I approached this question of Quad Plus. The immediate and rather knee jerk response was for what? I said, okay, let it, let's talk about non traditional security. And the response was, we have ARF, we have ADMM Plus, we have East Asia Summit. ARF does exactly what Quad, quad uh, you know, non traditional security issues are trying to do. Why do you want to duplicate? And all these members are there. So the role for Quad is secure, provide security, act as a deterrent. You do that. And let us not dilute and water down it by adding all those higher education things, etc. We can have another platform for that. India's role in Quad is unique. It is accepted because, and very much similar to 1998, when India exploded the bomb, the reaction was muted in Southeast Asia because countries knew that India as a nuclear power would be responsible, would add value to regional security dynamics. And that's precisely what has happened. So now India has to play that game again. Be a responsible power, follow the mandate, see what is written in the in, in your rule book and do it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. You have um, presented a viewpoint which can be debated, but unfortunately we are running out of time. May I request Dr. Quick Cheng Chui to say his piece in about a minute. Thank you, sir. I will try my best. So a very quick response to your excellent question uh, is of course that uh, there are lots of uh, common denominators uh, across uh, ASEAN countries' perception and policy towards India, primarily a function of uh, geographical proximity, power asymmetry, but also uh, historical cultural linkages. But uh, they certainly there are some subtle and also uh, important uh, differences across uh, 10 ASEAN countries. And uh, for example, for certain countries, Malaysia and uh, Singapore included, the relationship with uh, India is not completely external relations. There are certainly uh, domestic uh, elements of it because of the presence of uh, ethnic India in the country. And then uh, we can also uh, say that the certain countries like Vietnam, like Indonesia, like Philippines, Singapore, and to some extent Malaysia, our policy towards uh, India, there is a certain uh, strategic uh, consideration as well. And that's reflected uh, in the lots of uh, traditional and also a maritime uh, security uh, cooperation that is uh, growing. But other than that, I think uh, there are more common uh, denominators. If I can have uh, maybe uh, 20 seconds uh, to relate to some of the issues that were raised uh, by earlier speakers, I think uh, Professor uh, Depart mentioned about Zheng Jing Baiying, and then there were comments about uh, for ASEAN countries only uh, making uh, countries and powers uh, happy, and uh, we are trying to hedge prime primarily to uh, make profits and all that. I do think that uh, there are some uh, misunderstanding, misunderstanding and misperception about ASEAN countries' uh, policy in the sense that I think deference, showing a deference, non-confrontational, be a positive is certainly a one element, big element of uh, Southeast Asian countries' uh, policy as smaller countries' uh, policy. But I think defiance, to uh, defy, to say no, please and please uh, always uh, do at the same time. Southeast Asian countries have said no to uh, big powers like US and also uh, China. Sometimes we do it as a group, sometimes we do it individually. For example, uh, when US are uh, offered to join Petro uh, 2004 in the uh, Strait of Malacca, Indonesia and Malaysia said no and, and uh, thanks and no thanks. We are not uh, going into that. Same with uh, China. When we have to suspend BRI uh, projects, we would do so. So I think defiance and uh, deference uh, go hand in hand, which uh, shows that uh, the logic of a uh, multi-layered uh, uh, tendency. And uh, that I would like to uh, think that uh, my good friend uh, mentioned that, uh, Rahul mentioned that 
non-alignment is a uh, uh, multi-alignment is primarily unique to uh, India. I would think that uh, Southeast Asia naturally have that uh, tendency. Absolutely. And that, to a large extent, actually, it's a to some extent, is because of the legacy of a uh, Hindu influence. Like we uh, remember uh, before the arrival of Islam, uh, this region is very much the overlapping uh, mandalas. So we do not see things as a black and white, uh, yes and no, either or. But it's a multi-layered, and hence uh, the current uh, multi uh, kind of uh, multi-layered uh, approaches and also alignment is uh, only a uh, natural. But clearly, there are other uh, strategic consideration as uh, uh, what the, the Dr. Uh, Sh uh, Professor Shankari has mentioned uh, about the strategic autonomy. I will stop here. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, dear panelists, uh, for uh, really covering a, a vast ground, which is full of complexities. Uh, uh, dear audience members, you would have noted that uh, although we all tried to focus attention on the global and regional trends. Uh, uh, Southeast Asia scholars have to necessarily keep coming to their turf and talk about uh, the specifics of the India-ASEAN uh, relationship. Uh, what certainly comes out very clearly is that in the past two to three years, the scene has uh, gone a significant uh, transformation. Uh, there is no longer uh, uh, an exclusive focus on inclusivity or even on ASEAN related institutions, uh, including EAS. Uh, now we have seen uh, uh, quite a proliferation of new formations and groupings about which you heard. Some uh, views you may have found acceptable, others may be more debatable. But what comes out very clearly uh, in response to some sharp questioning from the panelists is the uh, measure or level of uh, unhappiness uh, with the present uh, level and character of the relationship. This is the challenge for the academic leadership uh, to offer candidly some advice, some suggestions uh, to the policy makers. Uh, they all have made it clear that they are satisfied with what uh, ACTI's policy has achieved what India-ASEAN relationship has achieved in the past 30 years, but they are really keen and anxious that the uh, pace and level and range of cooperation between the two sides must expand farther, uh, further and faster, particularly in light of the recent global and regional developments. I think that is the uh, major takeaway from this rather complex dialogue, which of course I'm not in a position to fully summarize due to the lack of time. But let me uh, in the end uh, uh, invite the audience to express their deep appreciation to our distinguished panel uh, and also to thank our hosts, uh, ICWA, RIS, AIC and others who have done a tremendous job in uh, organizing this conference. Thank you very much and uh, good night from Seattle, US. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of ICW and AIC, we would like to thank our distinguished chair and our speakers. Uh, we would break now for about 45 minutes and we will start with, the sec with session two at uh, 1.30 Indian Standard Time. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Bye-bye.